This podcast is brought to you by Bloomberg Law. For more information about our professional services for the legal industry, please call 212-617-6569. You're listening to the Bloomberg Law Intellectual Property Review. I'm Josh Block. Green Day, the California punk band, was sued for copyright infringement by a Los Angeles artist, Derek Seltzer. Seltzer accused Green Day of using his work, Scream Icon, without authorization as a backdrop for performances of their song, East Jesus Nowhere. Seltzer was seeking as much as $150,000 for each act of infringement. The court found that Green Day's use was substantially transformative and a fair use. Joining me now to discuss the court's ruling is Michael Dunn, editor of Bloomberg Law's Intellectual Property Law Report. Michael, tell me about the work in question. When I when I hear about a Scream icon, my first thought is of the painting The Scream, and then I think about the mask from the Scream movies, but neither of those are what we're talking about here. Will you describe the work? Yeah, I, I think most people's first thought is the, the famous uh, Scream uh, by Edward Munch, but uh, this one is, is more of a... It, it, Seltzer describes himself as a, sort of a youth artist um, involved in sort of the skateboard community. So his, his image is actually, the way the court describes it is as a dramatic image of a frightened fang-toothed human face that's contorted in the expression of a cry or a scream. Uh, having looked at the work online, I think it's, it's similar in a lot of respects to some of, um, some of the works of people like Shepard Ferry. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the famous Shepard Ferry Obey art uh, that you see in, in skateboard culture a lot. The Andre but the Giant. That's uh, right. It's, it's a similar type of work to that, but this one is, is a close-up on a sort of agonized, screaming, banged face. Tell me more about the plaintiff, um, Derek Seltzer. He he was more of he's more of a street artist, I assume, like Banksy or Shepard Ferry or th- these guys. That's right. He he's a, he he was more of a street artist before he was involved in sort of the skateboard uh, youth culture, and uh, he basically reproduced this image all over the place on stickers, posters, um, you know, posted them all over Los Angeles and other cities. Um, and so it was one of those ubiquitous type works, sort of like the Obey. Uh, poster from Shepard Ferry that you would see all over the place in, in the city. And Green Day didn't just take Seltzer's work. There were there were others involved. There are other defendants here. Um, a photographer, Richard Staub, and the production company. What were their roles? It, it looks like Richard Staub originally photographed this work uh, on his own. He, he had um, come across the, the Scream icon poster on a particular wall in a corner in Los Angeles, and it, uh, it was surrounded by graffiti and some other, some other posters and other street artworks. And he had, he had taken a, a photograph of it uh, just on his own. And I think what, what, the way the court describes it, it appears that later on Green Day and this um, performance environment design company that was sort of their production designers for their tour had approached Richard Staub and asked him to design uh, backdrops for them to use in their performance uh, for their whole tour, for all of the songs, basically, that they performed. The video backdrop that incorporated Scream Icon was used when Green Day performed East Jesus Nowhere, and the intent of the songwriter, Green Day's lead singer, Billy Joe Armstrong, comes into play in the decision. What is the song about? Uh, According to Billy Joe, it's about uh, the hypocrisy of religion. Um, And and the, the court mentions that with respect to whether the use that Green Day was putting the, the work to that we'll discuss in a little bit was, um, was a transformative, whether it was basically the same, the same intent behind the use as, as the, the original artist had or whether they were doing something different with it. And the court ruled that this was a fair use, and there are four factors that courts consider in a fair use case. The court really focused on two of those factors here. Um, first, the, the purpose and character of the use. Uh, how did the court come out on that factor? That, that's right. In, in most modern fair use analysis, that's the most important factor in determining whether something is a fair use. And in this case, the court found that Green Day's and, and Richard Stobbs' use was, was a transformative use of the work. Essentially, he added... Um, he, he did focus in on his, on his own photograph. He focused in on the screen icon itself, but he changed the colors in the backdrop. He added a bunch of graffiti around the image and a brick backdrop, and then um, he sort of spray-painted digitally a large red cross over the image itself, which brought the context of the, the song, uh, the hypocrisy of religion, into the work. And, the, you know, the court contrasted this with what... Seltzer had said his work was meant to represent, which was, you know, youth culture, insider, outsider culture, and, and street art in general. And the, the court found that this was transformative because the, the use was completely different here. Right. Seltzer's own words actually sank him here. Um, 
what did he say that helped the court decide that Green Day's use was transformative in nature? Yeah, he actually testified that, that the use by Green Day tainted the original message of his work, and he made it synonymous with the lyrics, the video, and the concert tour of Green Day. And basically he said that he made the image tailored to his needs, and now Green Day's come along and without his permission has defaced his image and sort of maliciously, I I think his exact words were, maliciously devalued the original intent. Uh, and the court said this is this is clear evidence that basically the message behind the two works are so different that it was the transformative use of the work. When he said that, was it obvious that he had, do you think it was obvious to his attorney that he had sunk his claim? Uh, it, it probably wasn't obvious because it, the, the point of his statement basically in saying that they were sort of corrupting his work and devaluing his work was to, to show that Green Day in no way had any sort of permission to use this image, and they in no way were sort of representing him in a positive light. In this court's analysis, that actually factored into the the analysis of whether it was transformative. Other courts might have not taken the same view. The fourth factor, the effect of the use on the market for the work, also came out in favor of Green Day. Why? Uh, The court said that basically there, there was no way that this this backdrop, this electronic backdrop in a concert, was going to be any sort of replacement for the original work. No one was going to use, you know, Green Day's concert backdrop. They were going to buy that instead of the work. Um, there was no market that was destroyed that that the artist could no longer enter into. Again, this this analysis, while I think it's correct, it, it, it it's not the more modern and fair use analysis where oftentimes courts will say. They'll, they'll imagine a market, and they'll say the market that was impacted was not the market for the original work, but instead it was the artist's ability to license his work for use in concert backdrops. For example, if people can just get it for free, then that market is harmed. So, you know, this. while I think the analysis was correct, I just don't know that every court that heard this case would have would have taken the same approach. Do you think he, there's an opportunity for an appeal here? Yeah, I mean, there might be. It, it, I guess it depends on his, his funds and how much he wants to, to pursue the issue. Um, you know, I, I, we've seen in other decisions, even recent decisions, that uh, on, on similar issues that, that the court has come out quite differently. Derek Seltzer was self-described as an up-and-coming artist. Many more people now know who Derek Seltzer is because of this case. So do you think in some respect he was well-served by the lawsuit? I guess it would depend on whether he thinks this is good publicity or not. I mean, if you are if you really are involved in a sort of street culture, sort of youth culture, insider, outsider, you know, dynamic, is really going to court to sue someone in, in this way, especially suing a band like Green Day, is that really going to improve your popularity with the potential audience for your work, or is it going to damage it? Is it sort of what's been dubbed the Streisand effect, where, you know, complaining about something brings more attention to it than it would have gotten on its own. There was also a trademark claim. Why did the court decide that issue in Green Day's favor as well? I think the trademark claim was always sort of a stretch. Um, The court said that he wasn't even using the image in in any way as an indicator of source or origin of goods, which is necessary for trademark protection. So they didn't even get to the, the traditional confusion analysis that's done to determine whether or not a mark is infringing, because they said he wasn't using it as a mark at all. At all, And I think that's correct. I mean, he might have been selling the image on posters or postcards or distributing in some way, but I don't think he was identifying himself in some way or the goods that he was producing by that image. So it sounds like you agree with the court's analysis. Do you? Would you have been surprised if the fair use analysis had come out the other way? Yeah, I think the court's analysis, I agree with it, and I think it's good and it's thorough, but based on other recent decisions, even from the same court, even from other Central District of California uh, judges, I, I was a little surprised by the court's decision. Uh, th- there was a, another recent decision that they that they just handed down uh, involving uh, Terry Gaeta, who is also known as Mr. Brainwash. He was featured in the, uh, the Banksy documentary, Exit Through the Gift Shop, that just came out a little while ago. Uh, he, in that case, he had taken an image, a famous image of uh, Run DMC, and basically had distorted it in all kinds of different ways. He had produced several different variations of the same work, but some of them were changes in coloring in the background with things painted on top of the image, and some superimposed other people into the image or faces onto the Run DMC guys. Some, you know, put three-dimensional objects on top of the the, the photograph, and he, some of these he sold, and some of these he just displayed. And in and, and that decision, the, the, the judge in the Central District of California said the use wasn't transformative at all. And they said um, it, they, they were both works of art. They were both being displayed to the public. So there was no transformative 
use there. And they said that it affected the market for the original work because not only was there the substitution issue where people would now seek out Terry Gata's work instead of the original photographer's work, there was also the licensing opportunity that was sort of destroyed by this use. And I think some people had read that decision and some other ones that came out around the same time as sort of sounding the alarm for the way courts were going to treat appropriation art in general. And, and this, for this court to come out so strongly the other way, I think, has raised some eyebrows. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Law Intellectual Property Review. Look for new podcasts every Tuesday. Until then, you can find Bloomberg Law's Intellectual Property Law Report and the latest IP news at BloombergLaw.com. Copyright 2011, Bloomberg Finance LP, all rights reserved. The views expressed herein are those of the speakers and not of Bloomberg Finance LP. These discussions are for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice, which has to be addressed to particular facts and circumstances involved in any given situation. Bloomberg Finance LP and its affiliated entities do not take responsibility for the content contained herein and do not make any representation or warrant.